Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the first lecture in our final uh, fall semester series of LIR. Uh, this series is on topics related to artificial intelligence uh, or AI. I'm sure you've read or heard a lot about the anxieties created by rapid developments in AI. This series organized by my colleague Carlos Secan and myself is intended to offer both some informed background about the worries and some examples of beneficial or innovative possibilities afforded by AI. Originally, the first lecture would have been that of Stuart Russell, which would have given you a general background, but his presentation had to be rescheduled to December 5th because his presence was needed at a recent important international forum on AI, <laughs> um, which was discussing just these issues of anx anxieties and regulation and so on. Uh, so our first two lectures in the series will look at specific problems in which AI and machine learning are actually being applied. We begin today with the consideration of the prospect of improving healthcare through medical applications of AI. Our speaker is uh, Zaid, uh, sorry, Z Ziad, yeah. MD, uh, who is the Blue Cross of California Distinguished Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management in the School of Public Health. Dr. Obermeyer graduated from Harvard with a major in history and science, received an MPhil from Cambridge in history and philosophy of science before attending Harvard Medical School, doing his clinical residency in emergency medicine, and then serving as assistant professor of emergency medicine and healthcare policy at Harvard Medical School for several years. He came to our School of Public Health in 2018. He can, continues to practice emergency medicine in underserved parts of the US, much of his research has had to do with evaluating data about health outcomes in various scenarios and the application of machine learning to medical data in order to improve clinical practice while overcoming bias and fostering greater equity. Two months ago, Time included him in the 2023 list of the 100 mo most influential people working on artificial intelligence. So we're really privileged to have him here today to speak to us on AI, medicine, and the limits of the human mind. Welcome. Um, Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And I think um, I think one of the things that makes it hard to learn about AI is that so much of the conversation is at an abstract level that makes it hard to figure out like what's act, like what's a real use case that you can you know sink your teeth into and 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 think through. So in some ways, it it might not be a bad sequence to start with a very specific story about how AI can help. Um, which is what I'm going to try to tell you today. And the story is, um, it's uh, somewhat personal for me because um, because I'm an emergency doctor. And I imagine that um, at a series called Learning and Retirement, unfortunately, um, things about heart attack might, might be personal for you or family members as well, as it is for um, most Americans as one of the major causes of morbidity and mortality. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that commonness of heart attack um, as, as the leading cause of death in, in the US and in many other countries is why emergency doctors are so scared of it. Um, it is very common. And at the same time, it doesn't it doesn't really look like it does on TV most of the time. Like on TV, it's, you know, there's like a older gentleman who's like clutching his chest and saying something about an elephant. But um, in my experience, sometimes uh, women also have heart attacks and sometimes um, it presents with um, nausea or a little bit of lightheadedness or, or something subtle. And I think that's what makes it really hard is that lots and lots of people in ERs could be having a heart attack, um, but empirically, you know, even though it's common at the population level over time, in any ER, it's pretty rare. And so it just makes it like a very hard problem to solve. Lots of people could have it. It's really important to catch it because you don't want to miss heart attack. Um, but at the same time, um, you have to make these decisions about testing for heart attack. And those decisions are hard because even though, you know, it's really terrible to miss a heart attack, Testing for heart attack is also kind of terrible because it's incredibly expensive um, and it's invasive. Um, the, the gold standard test for heart attack is putting a, a catheter, a, a flexible metal tube into one of your arteries, usually through your wrist and snaking the catheter up um, into the coronary arteries that supply the heart muscle and looking for blockage under x-ray guidance. So this is an invasive procedure. It has risks. It's, it's, it requires a you know stay in the hospital 
Um, and, and that's the other thing that makes this, this decision so hard. It's like, you don't wanna miss heart attack, but at the same time, you can't test everybody in the ER. Um, and so um, one, you know, uh, in, in, re in a research problem, there's this inevitable oversimplification that you have to do. You have to do some violence to the complexity of the, of the world and real decisions and model them in a, in a simple way. So let me give you a simple model of how doctors should think about the testing decision, which is that any patient that you see in front of you has some probability of having a heart attack and you're trying to figure that out. Um, and if you test someone, like let's take the case of someone with a heart attack. If you test that person and you confirm that they are having a heart attack and you visualize that blockage, um, you can fix the blockage. You can put a stent in most commonly or sometimes schedule them for emergency open heart surgery, but you can reopen that blockage. You can resupply the heart muscle with the blood and the, and the oxygen and nutrients it needs. And that person can go on to have a long and healthy life with no trace of this heart attack. And it's just you know a transformative thing for that person. If you fail to test that person, um, at first, nothing might happen. You might say, well, this sounds like a little bit of acid reflux, or maybe it's a touch of pneumonia. Um, take this medication, go home, talk to your primary care doctor. And a lot of those people, at least in the short term, do fine. Um, some of them don't. Some of them have arrhythmias and, and terrible consequences from this heart attack that go on to kill them, uh, either shortly thereafter or over the next few years. And so there's a huge cost to missing heart attack and a huge benefit to treating heart attack. So what should physicians do? Well, physicians should, you know, uh, accurately estimate the probability that each certain, you know, person in front of them is having a heart attack. And if that probability is above some threshold, we should, you know, which we should define based on the cost effectiveness of testing and treating heart attack and the cost of the test and the benefit, above that threshold, we should be testing people for heart attack and below that threshold, we should not be testing. So, that's like what a perfect doctor would do in this slightly oversimplified world. So, so that's the ideal. Um, what's the reality? Well, um, real physicians have two problems. One problem is that we're practicing in a system with not very good incentives. Um, and even though this is changing over time, effectively hospitals are paid by the test. And so, you know, uh, uh, sorry, this caption might be a little bit small. Uh, modern medicine is, well, Bob, it looks like a paper cut, but just to be sure, let's do a lot of tests. And, uh, and we know that when we look at studies of how doctors test for heart attack, you know, 90%, sometimes 95% of these tests are negative in a way that looks quite wasteful and in a way that looks like, yeah, when you pay someone by the test, they're going to do a lot of tests. Um, so that's one problem. Um, but the other problem is that doctors are not perfect. And sometimes doctors make mistakes. And uh, this caption says, um, shows you how much I know. Um, and so I think that these two forces mean that doctors are not always behaving the way we would like doctors to behave. And, um, and, and so I think at least when I was, um, this was very pronounced for me in my first few years of being a doctor after residency. So during residency, you're given more and more autonomy over time, but ultimately the patient is always someone else's responsibility, you know, legally or whatever, but, but sort of metaphysically, there's always someone else that you can ask to, you know, for advice or to take this burden off of your plate. But after residency, you know, from like June 30th to July 1st, it's you. And it's really very stressful. And so I would, I would go home at night and I would just replay all of these cases in my head. And, um, and it's hard. And, and this was around the time, this was like in 2012 that I finished residency. This was around the time that you really started feeling like AI was doing miraculous things in other parts of your life. It was predicting what movies you we're gonna watch on Netflix and suggesting them to you. It was starting to predict which products you were gonna buy. It was certainly helping you navigate traffic and maps and things like that. So there were just these things going on outside of medicine where AI was predicting things very accurately, like shockingly accurately. And that's the, exactly the kind of task that doctors need to do every day. You need to predict based on, okay, I observe this data about a patient, what's the probability this patient's having a heart attack? That would be really, really useful to me 
in the ER. So that's that's what we did. So we we built an algorithm that um, and and to sort of since you haven't had the benefit of Stuart's um, wisdom on what AI is, let me just kind of um, describe it. So we so I was working at one of the Harvard teaching hospitals at the time. So we got data on every single ER visit to that hospital over a five year uh, five or six year period. And so we had basically like you can think of it as like a really big Excel sheet where each row was a visit, okay? So each row is like an ER visit by a patient. And in that row, we see a couple of things. We see, did the doctor test this person or not? Um, and then we see, did the test come back positive or not? But we also see if they didn't get tested, did bad things happen to them in the 30 days after this? So that spreadsheet is telling us a lot about that visit and, and sort of outcomes related to testing for heart attack at that visit. But that spreadsheet also has thousands and thousands of columns about that per person's electronic health data, record data leading up to that visit. So we see every medication that person has ever taken in the system. We see their laboratory studies, the diagnosis codes that they were assigned, procedures they've had, their blood pressure over time. We see a lot of things about this person. And all AI does is it takes all of those rich inputs about everything leading up to that visit, and what we used it to do was to say, okay, let's look at the people who got tested for heart attack, who got this invasive, um, dangerous, expensive test. Let's just use all of the information in the electronic health record to predict of all these people who get tested, who comes back with a positive test. So that's how we define heart attack risk, is someone who was tested for heart attack, did they have a positive test or not? And to give you a sense of where doctors are now, this is, you know, this is, at one of the Harvard teaching hospitals. So these doctors are no slouches. Um, uh, they, they certainly think they're pretty good. And at that hospital, about um, 15, 1.5% of the tests were coming back positive. So not, not great, not great. Um, so, um, so let me tell you a little bit about the algorithm. And I, I Against my better judgment, it's hard to convey some of these things without graphs. So I am showing you some graphs, but let me talk through this graph so that you know what you're looking at. So in this graph, um, we're looking at a bunch of people who got tested. And on the x-axis, I'm showing you from like low risk to high risk. So the algorithm has looked at a sample of people who are getting tested for heart attack. The doctors have decided to test because the doctor is worried enough about heart attack that they're willing to subject the person to the costs and the risks of testing. So doctors are already worried about these people. And the algorithm has been asked to sort them into 10 groups, each 10% of the data from low to high risk. So from left to right, you're going from low risk groups to high risk group. And each of those dots on the graph is 10% of the data. On the y-axis, you see the outcome of the test. So all these people are being tested because doctors were worried. But on the y-axis, you see the fraction of those tests that came back positive for each of those groups. And what you can see is that on the left side of the graph, those dots are very low on the y-axis, which implies that almost no one in those groups comes back with a positive test. Whereas, that, um, uh, and so, you know, you can put that number through the cost effectiveness machine and you would have to be willing to pay over a million dollars per life year to justify doing these tests. And as a rule of thumb, you know, um, in, in the US, the, the reasonable valuations for cost-effective medical care would be between $100,000 and $200,000 per life year. Uh, if you're in the UK or other parts of Europe, it's more like $50,000 per life year, uh, but we're, we're bigger spenders here. Um, and but But even by our standards. This is not cost-effective testing at all. This is an order of magnitude um, too expensive to be considered cost-effective. On the other hand, now let's look at on the, on the other side of the graph at the people that the algorithm thinks are very high risk. When those people get tested, over half of them have a heart attack. And, and that's very cost-effective, e even in the UK. Even British people would consider this cost-effective. So it's kind of a striking fact that, remember, all of these people, doctors were worried about heart attack, but the algorithm using data that was available to the doctor at the time of the test 
is able to distinguish between very low risk people and very high risk people. So that's interesting. And at the same time, it's also not totally surprising because, because of what we talked about, about incentives. Like I think everybody knows on some level that there's too much testing and that doctors are testing a lot of you know, low risk people because, you know, because of incentives. And so over testing, as we're showing here, it's not good, but it's not super surprising. So this is a fact about people who got tested. Um, but we can also generate a fact about people who didn't get tested. And so, you know, untested people, we have this problem because we can use the algorithm to generate predictions. We can ask the algorithm, if this person were tested, what's their likelihood of, you know, the test coming back positive? But the problem with the untested people is that we don't have the test result. <laughs> and so you can't take this straightforward approach to knowing if the algorithm was right or wrong in those people, because the whole point is that they're not tested. And we might like them to be tested, but we don't have the test result. And so we can't say, at least with the data we have so far, when the algorithm disagrees with the human. So effectively, the algorithm is saying, oh, look at this person. This person looks super high risk. You should test them but the physician doesn't test them. How do we know who's right? So we have to do some detective work. And here's how we did the detective work. Um, and, and this, I think, answers one of the questions that I saw flash by in the chat. So we're gonna take all of the untested patients and we're gonna take out anyone where the doctor has diagnosed or even mentioned heart attack in their note from that ER visit. So. If the doctor is like, you know, um, saying, well, I'm worried about heart attack, but this patient really doesn't want to be tested. They need to go home or they don't, you know, they can't um, stay for the test or something like that. We take all those people out because we have access to the, the note that the doctor wrote and all of the diagnoses that the doctor assigned and things like that. And we take out anyone, this is a very coarse measure, but we take out anyone 80 years old or above because in those people, the doctors might say, well, sure, they were at high risk, but I can't subject this um, older person to the, to the risks of testing. So we were honing in on people where it didn't look like the doctor was worried about heart attack, and it didn't look like they were um, you know, over 80 years old, they didn't have metastatic cancer or anything else that we could see that would make them not candidates for testing. And then we asked the algorithm to do the same thing. So we just asked the algorithm to generate risk scores and we put those you know, on the same, same thing, left, low risk, right, high risk. And now we're gonna look in the 30 days after those visits where people were, they came to the ER, they weren't tested. Um, did any of the following things happen? Did they come back after that visit on a separate occasion and get diagnosed with a heart attack or treated um, with a heart attack? And we confirm that with laboratory studies that indicate that people are having heart attacks. Did they have cardiac arrest or need cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR? Um, in, in a, these are some of the adverse events that happen um, from untreated heart attack. Or did they die? And we ascertained death by looking not just at the hospital records, but at the social security data. So we linked all these data to social security records to see if people had died outside the hospital. Well, you can see on this graph, it, it's also sloping up. And so, you know, if you look at the top bin of risk. So these are the, this is like the, you know, one to 2% of people that the algorithm considers to be extremely high risk, such that if they were tested, they'd have a, you know, at least a 50% a chance of, of having a heart attack. When these people are sent home without being tested, about 16% of them have one of these adverse events at the 30 day mark. And by comparison, if you look at the clinical guidelines, like the guidelines that emergency doctors use to figure out, okay, what's the level of risk that should mandate testing? That's at about 2%. So you should be testing anyone who's above a 2% risk of one of these adverse events. We're finding people that are at 16% risk. So these people are much riskier than the guidelines would, would say that we should be testing them, but they're not being tested. And you know th these aren't just like, you know, oh, someone gets diagnosed with a small heart attack, but they're fine. It's not a big deal if you miss it. About a third of these adverse events, like so, you know, 5.6% of these people actually just die in the 30 days after their untested visits when the algorithm said that they should have been tested. 
So these are sizable um, adverse event risks that the algorithm is finding in untested patients that the, that the doctor doesn't seem to suspect of heart attack. So I think so far, you know, I hope some of this has convinced you that the algorithm is honing in on people that are genuinely high risk. And they're high risk if they're tested and they're high risk if they're untested. And we see that in different ways, but, but they're high risk. But, you know, I think uh, a lawyer or, or a grumpy seminar participant might say, well, this is kind of circumstantial evidence. And what you want to say is that these people should be testing because testing would improve their health. But all you've shown me is that these people are high risk. You haven't told me anything about like the benefit of testing. And so we're going to take advantage of um, what, what the economists call a, um, a natural experiment in the data. So one of the um, in some ways, scary things about our healthcare system is that it seems to really matter which doctor you get, like when you go to the ER, and it seems to really matter like what time you go in because one doctor is working and that doctor likes to test a lot, but you go in a few minutes later and you get a second doctor who doesn't like to test a lot. And so, and so we actually are able to find these kinds of variations, which is not news. Like this is a very consistent finding in any sorts of study of the American healthcare system. There's just a lot of randomness. And so what it means is that if you come in on a Monday at 3 p.m. Uh, this week, you're going to get a doctor and a, and a team of residents and nurses, and, and they might just test people a lot. But if you come in next Monday at 3 p.m., you're gonna get a totally different team of doctors. And, and the group of people coming in Mondays at 3 p.m. Are, are very similar from one week to the next, but the doctors are quite different. And so there's like a 15 to 20% difference in your likelihood of getting tested, holding constant anything else, just based on the, the team of people that you see when you walk into the ER. And so we're gonna use that somewhat concerning fact to, to our advantage. And we're gonna ask the question, okay, well, Let's ask the usual question that gets asked in these settings, which is like, you know, some doctors do more, some doctors do less. Do patients do any better when doctors do more? And the answer to that question, at least at first glance, is no. So we're going to just compare all of the patients that come in on high testing shifts to low testing shifts. And we're going to look at their heart attack, their cardiovascular outcomes over the year after that visit. And we're going to find no difference in any of those adverse events that I told you about. Um, and specifically, if you just look at one year mortality after the, these visits, it's the same, whether you come in on it. So, so this, I think, sounds a lot like the usual narrative we hear about the healthcare system, which is like, there's so much waste. And some doctors are doing a lot, and it doesn't matter. And so we just need to get rid of those doctors or retrain those doctors to do less. Less is more. Um, and I think that you know, that, that's certainly what this looks like. But, but I think the problem with that statement is that it's telling you about the average. Because it's telling you, on average, patients don't benefit from testing for heart attack. But on average, <laughs> patients are not having heart attacks. Most patients are not having a heart attack. So if you test them more or less, it doesn't matter. Of course not. Like, you can test a person without a heart attack and you can spend a lot of money testing them, it's not gonna help their health. So what if we used our algorithm to hone in on the people that are very likely to be having a heart attack? And let's look at how those people do when they come in on a high testing shift or a low testing shift. And what we find is that for that highest one to 2% of patients, if you walk in on a high testing shift, you die 32% less over the next year than if you walk in on a low testing shift. And that difference in a very small group of patients gets obscured when you're looking at these huge groups of patients. And so yes, testing more or less is wasteful on average, but if you hone in on people who are having a heart attack, that's not wasteful. That's very high value care. But you're not gonna see those things unless you hone in on those patients. And so I think that's one of the things that AI is increasingly gonna let us do in medicine is to not just look at averages and, and whole populations in the way that, you know, like I, 
I think I'm allowed to say this because I'm on faculty at, at a school of public health in a way that public health usually does. Like public health measures are usually kind of dumb in the sense that they treat everyone the same way, but everyone's not the same. Like everyone had different levels of COVID risk. We treated everyone the same. Um, we did so out of necessity in many ways, but um, that what's, what's adequate public health is not very good medicine. And I think that when your interventions are expensive and, um, and potentially dangerous, treating everyone the same way can be, um, can be disastrous. And so I you know, think about AI as almost like X-ray vision. It lets you look at this whole population of people that are, you know, that look indistinguishable at first and start seeing these really important distinctions between the high risk and the low risk people in a way that's gonna help you allocate these precious resources that we have to save lives in the emergency setting and, and elsewhere. One interesting implication of this is that the usual prescription that we have for our healthcare system, for fixing the problems with our healthcare system, is probably not the right prescription. And so, you know, again, to go back to this idea of like, oh, you know, some hospitals do more, some hospitals do less, we just have to like cut back. Um, so this graph is showing you when humans decide to test more or less what happens. So again, the, the algorithm predicted risk is on the x-axis. So low risk to high risk, left to right. And now I'm showing you the rate at which people get tested by different doctors. So I'm taking all that variation of like, you come in on Monday at 3 p.m. this week versus next week, you see a different team of doctors who likes to test you more. So I'm just organizing this by high testing doctors versus low testing doctors. And we're gonna look at the testing rate as a function of risk. And so at the top, the purple line is showing you like the high testing, you know, triage uh, teams. Who do they test more? Well, you can see that the top line is above the low line everywhere. And so, you know, there's good news, which is that if you think about a low testing doctor and you look at the low risk patients, they're testing those low risk patients less, which is great. That's exactly what we want them to do. The problem that you can already see is that they're also testing the high risk patients less. So when doctors test less or more, they test everyone less or more. And they don't do the thing that the algorithm would do, which is don't test the low risk patients, test the high risk patients. And this isn't just a, uh, a, an artifact of the fact we were looking at one weird hospital in Boston. We can recreate this approach in Medicare data and we find the exact same pattern across hospitals. So low testing hospitals test everyone less, high testing hospitals test everyone more. And so you can see the goal of getting all doctors to look like low testing doctors or all hospitals to, to look like low testing hospitals is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, we wanna test low risk people less, but we don't want that to result in testing high risk people less. So by contrast, what, what would an AI do? Well, if you ask the algorithm, the algorithm would cut testing by about half. So about 46% reduction in testing if you just tested according to the algorithmic predictions. But there's a very important nuance here, which is that the algorithm would actually cut all of the tests in low risk patients, like patients below the cost effectiveness threshold, all those tests would be cut, which would result in cutting 62% of tests but the algorithm would also add back in some of those tests for high risk patients. So you wouldn't just cut over utilization, you would reallocate some of that over testing and correct the under testing that is also going on right now. And I think that's a deep point about the healthcare system that really you know, resonates with me as a doctor is like, we're not just making one kind of mistake, we're making all the kinds of mistakes. And it's not just about incentives pushing us to do more. There are a bunch of things that make us do less when we should be doing more too. And, and so it's not so much a question of, are we testing too much? Are we testing too little? We're just testing the wrong people. And that's a very, very different explanation from our usual explanation about incentives. Because when you think about incentives, incentives can't explain why we're doing too few tests in high-risk patients. That doesn't make any sense from an incentive point of view. 
like those patients are not, it's not just that there are more tests, that's like more money if you're paid by the test. A positive test, that's like the biggest money maker for the hospital. Because when you have a positive test, then you get the treatments, you go to the ICU, you get all sorts of extra procedures, you're in the hospital for like, heart attack is a very high margin business for hospitals. So there's no model of incentives that you can write down where physicians and hospitals would fail to test the highest risk patients that are coming through the ER. It just doesn't make any sense from an incentive point of view. So, so what is going on? Um, we, we actually took our cue from, I don't know if you know that there's this old literature uh, in this kind of field of judgment and decision-making that contrasts what humans do to what statistical models do. Um, and, and that I think is, gives us two really important insights into the mind of physicians um, when they're making these important decisions. So there's one school of thought in psychology that suggests that humans are basically rational, but we're rational in ways that are limited or bounded in the sense that we don't have infinite attention. We can't focus on everything. We can't remember everything. And we have these just cognitive limits of how many operations we can do per minute that, that mean that within the constraints of our own hardware and software, we're doing pretty well. But our hardware and software are like, they're, they're not perfect and they can't process all this information. So, so what we did to explore, so this is one hypothesis we can test. And the way we test it is we can, so we have this artificial intelligence set up and we can, we can ask our model to say, okay, you're currently using about 16,000 variables to predict someone's risk of heart attack. So that's the model that we've been using so far. So one of the tweaks that you can make when you're building these AI models is you can say, well, don't use 16,000 variables, use 15,000 variables, or use 10,000 variables, or use 10 variables. So you can have the algorithm basically limit itself to attending to a subset of the variables that it could be attending to and predict risk. So this is a little bit like having a good risk predictor that's limited in how much it can pay attention to. And so we built all of these different algorithms and then we asked those algorithms two questions. Number one is, looking at these simplified versions of our real model, how well do those predict the patient outcome? Are they actually having a heart attack? And how well does it predict the physician's decision of whom to test? And what you can see is that the, if you were building like the best risk model, you would probably, you would include like hundreds of variables, like the, the, the best performing model it looked through all those like 16,000 variables and it found the 224 best variables to predict heart attack. And that was like the best model. But the best model to predict the physician's testing decision used 49 variables. So physicians are basically like a pretty good algorithm, but an algorithm that couldn't look through 16,000 variables or 200 variables, it could only use about 50 variables. So physicians are a little bit like a very limited algorithm, but given those limits, it's a pretty good algorithm. So we can also, as a way of getting insight into a second hypothesis, look at how physicians are using the variables that they seem to be paying attention to. So we take those 49 variables that predict the physician's testing decision. and we just look at, you know, for each of these variables, how well does it predict the patient outcome that's on the, the horizontal axis? And then how well does it predict the physician's testing decision? And you can see the points are kind of clustered around this line. There's a pretty good correlation between things that correlate with true risk and things that drive the physician's testing behavior. But there are some outliers. So for example, chest pain is a pretty good predictor of, of having a heart attack but it's a, it's a very salient variable for doctors. They are overusing it relative to its importance. And they're also overusing age relative to its importance for predicting heart attack. And they're underusing um, sex 
and someone's income, which we also have access to. And so it looks like physicians are doing a pretty good job, but there are these variables that are overweighted or underweighted relative to where they should be weighted. And I think this brings us into like, there's a different psychology literature, which is like the thinking fast and slow literature on predictable errors and biases that physicians have when we're assessing data. And the things that seem to really stand out to physicians that they are overusing are things related to symptoms and things related to the patient's demographics, like their age. And it's not totally surprising because this is actually the way medical education and medical communication works. When you open up the New England Journal of Medicine and you look at their case records, how do they describe patients? A 54-year-old man with irritability, confusion, and odd behaviors. This might sound like someone you know, but this is a case report in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is how doctors communicate to each other. When I am working in the ER and a new patient comes in, the first thing I see about them is their age, their uh, sex, and their symptom that they're coming in with. And as a shorthand in the hospital, you often, and this is not a great reflection on physicians or healthcare providers, but you often talk about like, oh, the chest pain in room four. So these are things that are very present in our minds and they're present for a reason because symptoms are important, but we are over attending to some of those things at the expense of other things that we should be paying attention to. Um, and so, you know, um, symptoms are overweighted. Uh, stereotypical symptoms of heart attack, like chest pain are, are very much overweighted. And then complex numerical data, like laboratory studies over time, vital sign trends and things like that are underweighted. And so physicians are paying too much attention to some things and too little attention to other things as a function of what stands out to us and what kind of information we can process. Um, I'll just tell you briefly about like, so all of these analyses were done in data that had already been collected. So we were able to mimic you know, uh, a randomized trial by looking at this, this quirk about doctors testing more or less. Um, but we're currently rolling this algorithm out as a randomized trial um, in a much, much larger health system with lots and lots of different hospitals where we have much bigger sample size. Um, and, and if the algorithm rebuilds well in this new environment, we're gonna roll this out as a randomized trial and actually see if this algorithm leads to better patient outcomes or not. So I think there's a view in a lot of this intersection of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and healthcare that it's gonna transform healthcare basically as a product that's gonna improve decisions and you know, lead to efficiency. And I think that is true. And I think that would be great. I think that there's also a way in which artificial intelligence can drive deeper understanding of the things that we're trying to improve. And so here, I think I learned a lot um, about the, the way that um, inefficiency looks in healthcare. Like it's not just overuse, but it's also underuse. Uh, and I also learned a lot about the nature of my own behavior as a physician, like what I have been paying too much attention to and what I should be paying more attention to. Um, and I hope that you all uh, also learned something over the past uh, 45 minutes.